Well, hi, everybody. Very happy to be here today. And I'm just going to share with you a little bit of a story. I hope you can all hear me okay. And uh, I'm going to walk you through uh, a couple of different topics. The first one, and hopefully that will move smoothly into, into the next, is to talk about how childhood adversity can increase the risk of mental and physical illnesses later in life and then some tools around how to build resilience so that you can confront adversity as you become older and move along in your life that you can become stronger with time. So I'm gonna start by asking a question. First of all, I'm gonna look at my phone and make sure no one's telling me that you can't hear me. How does early life adversity impact the development of mental and physical illnesses later in life? And in order to share this, it's important that I, I, I share a little bit of science. Starting off with explaining a little bit about your DNA or a little bit of genetics. So I'm gonna take, take you back to your university genetics course or your high school genetics course when you learned about this and let you know that you're more like your parents than you realize that every single cell in your body contains DNA. And it is exactly the same DNA in every cell. 50% came from your mom, 50% came from your dad. And if you have siblings, they're different from you because they got a different 50%. So it really is a genetic lottery what you're going to end up with. However, if you're identical twins, you have exactly the same DNA. So this is a, a, a picture of a different chromosomes and it will be identical if you have an identical twin. If you have a fraternal twin or a non-identical twin, it's just like having any other sibling, they will have different DNA. However, we also know that identical twins, although they may start out with exactly the same DNA, can, based on environment and other factors, end up looking, feeling, behaving in very different ways because our environment is really very powerful in shaping who we are. Uh, again, back to some science here, and, and the first picture you'll see here is of a, a cell and the nuclei of the cell, and inside the nucleus are these Xs, which are in fact chromosomes. And if you unwrap those chromosomes, you will see that they're made up of that DNA, 50% from mom, 50% from dad, exactly the same in every single cell. And if you go inside the nucleus, you will find there's RNA in there. We're hearing a lot of, about RNA because we now have RNA vaccines for the coronavirus. And what the RNA does is it helps to transcribe or reprint and translate that DNA into proteins. And proteins are essential for life. Every enzyme, every neurochemical, all of the things that we make from our DNA help us to be alive, to do all of the processes that are necessary to breathe, to move, they're essential. Now, if you have exactly the same DNA in every single cell, and remember we start by a sperm and an egg coming together, and then we start to differentiate. How do our cells, how do, how do we, are, are we programmed to become all of these different cells? How does a cell, an embryonic stem cell, know to become a liver cell or a hair cell or a brain cell or a skin cell? Well, that is determined by what's called epigenetics. And that's really what I'm going to focus on is the power of epigenetics. A little deeper dive here into you and the fact that you're a genetic symphony. And what that means is, or what I'm trying to give you an analogy around is I want you to think about your DNA as being like a piano keyboard. Every single one of us has a unique piano keyboard, unless you're an identical twin, and then your twin will have the same piano keyboard as you have. The keys on that keyboard are your genes. Now, what's important to know is that the, each uh, key is a little segment of DNA. That's what a gene is. And it's responsible for a particular note. As you know, if you play that key, it's going to have a particular note. And that is really, uh, in our um, analogy here, it's responsible for a trait. Whether you have blue eyes or blonde hair or, or a certain disorders will be determined by whether or not that key is played. Of course, all of those keys come together to play what is the music of you, right? The genes that are used or not used, how they're transcribed, how they're expressed, determines who you are. So epigenetics is really a determination of if 
when or how a gene is expressed. Not all genes are expressed. Some are, some aren't. So dominant genes are always expressed. If you have uh, brown eyes, you have a dominant brown gene. If you have Huntington's in your family and someone gets that Huntington's disease, it's because it's a dominant gene. We also have recessive genes, which they're only expressed when, when you have one from each parent. An example would be blue eyes. The only way that you have blue eyes is if you got a blue eye gene from your mom and a blue eye gene from your dad. Uh, uh, cystic fibrosis is a recessive disorder, which means the on only way to have cystic fibrosis is if you have a gene from mom and a gene from dad. Otherwise, if you just have one gene, it's not going to be fully expressed and you're called a carrier. You have a carrier, you're a carrier of that gene. Now, how those genes are expressed can change over time. So they're not, they're not always expressed. They're expressed at different times. So that means that your tune, your music can change over time. Sometimes they're, certain genes are played or expressed, other times they're not. So our music changes through our life. So you got to think about your DNA in every single cell of your body as being written in pen. You can't erase it. You can't change it. It's the same in every cell. But epigenetics is written in pencil. How your genes are expressed, when they're expressed, is based on many factors, and it changes over time. Now, there are a number of different epigenetic processes, different ways that epigenetics works. There's normal epigenetic genetic cascades or, or processes telling, as I said earlier, how, how a single cell becomes a brain cell or a liver cell or an eyeball cell, but also what happens when you go into puberty? How does your body know it's time to go into puberty and that you're supposed to, if you're a woman, uh, make more estrogen? That is an epigenetic cascade. What, if, what, what about when you get pregnant? Your body knows when, you, uh, when an egg is uh, fertilized by a sperm exactly what should happen next because an epigenetic cascade starts to, to work. Same thing going into menopause. But there are also other ways that our genes are impacted. Sorry, I'm gonna take my earring off. It's making some noise, which I'm sure is annoying. Uh, so one, one kind of uh, way that we're affected or epigenetics is affected is by stress. And it can be uh, while you're still in utero, while you're still inside your mother, that her stress can be uh, passed on to you or environmental stress at the same time can be passed on you. But really very critically, we know that early life stress, uh, facing uh, adversity when you're very young can have an impact on how your genes are transcribed, how your genes are expressed. And it can lead to psychiatric disorders. It can lead to physical health disorders. And I'm going to show you some science to back that up. There's also toxic related, toxin related epigenetics. And this is actually how I learned all about this was by listening to Quirks and Quarks on CBC radio. And Bob McDonald was talking about how we're seeing more lung cancer uh, in younger individuals or, or mouth cancer in younger individuals who never smoked, who didn't grow up next to an asbestos uh, factory, for instance. Why were they, why are they developing this cancer? And his explanation was about epigenetics. So unfortunately, through a lot of research, we've learned that sometimes this can be heritable, that you can, that being exposed to toxins that make you vulnerable to certain cancers can also be passed down to subsequent generations. So just to show you, uh, pretend this is a, a family member of yours, maybe your grandfather, and maybe he didn't have a particularly healthy diet, and maybe he was a smoker, but he was also pretty healthy in other ways. So he played a lot of soccer, he was physically active. So when uh, uh, the next generation is in utero, often those, those risk factors are taken out, out of the embryo. The embryo no longer is at risk, so they get pulled off. But unfortunately, some of those epigenetic changes caused by the smoking can st stay on and be passed down to subsequent generations. So your grandfather's two pack per day habit could potentially be passed down to you making you vulnerable at some point, being exposed to some kind of environmental factor that turns on the gene to cause the cancer or turns off protective genes that cause cancer. So I know it's a complicated process, but it, it, 
it speaks to the power of environment and lifestyle and the fact that the choices we make now can be passed down generationally. These are just some of many factors that can uh, have epigenetic impact that can change the way that our genes are influenced. And some are positive like exercise, for instance. And uh, we just heard about the, the power of uh, a healthy diet and extremely valuable to have a healthy gut microbiome, to have healthy bacterium living in your gut. But then there are some things that have a negative impact. And as I mentioned, like toxic chemicals, drugs of abuse and psychological stress we know can have an impact. Now, there are a whole bunch of different risk factors for depression. Depression is biopsychosocial, which means there are biological risk factors like different kinds of brain chemicals. There's psychological risk factors. Uh, maybe you're more vulnerable. Maybe you're more resilient, the kind of way that you cope with stress, your coping skills, and also social. Social factors are things like if you're under a lot of financial stress or you're in an abusive relationship. So all of those come together to, to develop risk factor for or to present as a risk factor for depression. What are the greatest risk factors for depression? Childhood maltreatment, abuse, not just physical, sexual, emotional abuse, which are, of course, extremely important, but even chaos or neglect are important risk factors for depression the lack of social support. Social support is one of the greatest protectors of our mental health. Inflammation, and unfortunately, I don't have time to get deeply into the whole inflammatory story, but very powerful, and genetics. So all of these, to me, are our most important risk factors for depression. So I talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the science that underlies our understanding of the importance of nurturing and the importance of life experience when, when you're young in, in making you more vulnerable uh, for mental and physical illnesses later in life. And much, much of this research has been done with rats. Now, I don't know if you know much about rats, but rat mums tend to be loving and nurturing while rat dads are generally deadbeat dads. So most of the research on nurturing comes from rat mums and their pups. Now, of course, we know that rat uh, human dads and two dads and two moms and moms and dads together all can be wonderful, loving, nurturing parents. So the reason this is focused on rat moms is because rat dads generally not, not great dads. So what's very interesting about rat moms is that there are, they come in two kinds. One are high lickers and the other kind are low lickers. High licking rats lick their pups a whole lot, of course, and low licking rats, not so much. This is a staple trait, which means that if you are a high licked pup, you're very likely to become a high licked mom yourself. But we also know that environmental stress predicts the level of licking. So if you are not licked a lot, or if you're in a high stress environment, you're likely to be licked less often by your mom. And that means that you're less likely to be a high licked mom yourself. Now, that tactile stimulation of licking is not just a feel-good experience. It actually has a massive impact on growth. So it has an impact on growth hormone, as well as suppressing hormones that inhibit growth. So we know that the licking impacts your response to stress or the rat pup's response to stress, how, how sensitive they are to stress, their brain development, their cognition, their ability to learn, to remember, their metabolic functions, their risk of diabetes or obesity and their reproduction. Do they have uh, strong, healthy pups? They have more pups and healthier pups when they come from a high licking mom. Now, just a quick note, because I'm gonna bring you back to the rats on cortisol. Cortisol is our most uh, important stress hormone. It helps us to manage acute and chronic stress and bring us back to homeostasis, to get our, our brains and our bodies back to normal. It's a potent anti-inflammatory hormone. And the reason it's so important is because if you're in a high level of stress over an extended period of time and your cortisol is very, very high, that can actually provoke nerve damage and tissue damage. So the idea is that cortisol goes up when you're stressed out and it helps to bring your brain and your body back down to normal as quickly as possible. That licking from those rats is actually connected to cortisol levels. So the gene for the cortisol receptor and the, re so you have cortisol and the cortisol goes in the receptor, that gene to make those cortisol receptors is influenced by the amount of maternal care. 
So if you're a high licking mom, your pups are going to have all kinds of cortisol receptors, and that helps you to manage your stress response, to keep the level of cortisol uh, at a more regular level. If you come from a low licking mom, that means that you're going to have fewer cortisol receptors. And so your cortisol level is going to change a great deal. You're less able to manage the stress response when you come from a low lick mom. Now, there's some good news in this story because we know that if you have a high licked pup and they're adopted, sorry, if you have a low licked pup and they're adopted by a high licking mom, their cortisol levels can actually normalize. So there's a value to um, changing the environment for those pups. The question we don't know the answer to is how long before the change really is not valuable, that the, the vulnerability of that pup it lasts a lifetime. And we don't know that. And it, it's probably very, um, for human beings, probably highly variable, depending on a lot of different circumstance. But th this is a really good news story in the fact that uh, babies who are exposed to trauma early in life or adversity early in life, it's a time when their brain is really plastic and there is an opportunity to intervene. Now, I, I mentioned about epigenetics and the fact that you get half your genes from mom and half your genes from dad, and both mom and dad and their lifestyle choices are important in the outcome of these pups and the health of these pups. So we know that there's all kinds of different environmental insults and influences that can change the epigenetics, change whether your genes are, are going to be expressed or not. And this can lead to long lasting behavioral changes. And I want to draw your attention because we talked about food in the stretching part. And I mentioned about the, the value of a healthy gut biome. We know that food deprivation in the first generation of mice leads to decreased serum glucose levels in second generation in their offspring. So it actually changes their metabolics. When male rats eat high fat diet, their female pups have a greater risk of type 2 diabetes. So all of these things we're starting to learn about the fact that lifestyle in our parents can have an impact on their, their pups or their, their uh, offspring, both male and female lifestyle. So we can't blame our moms and we can't blame our dads. Everyone is equally at risk and responsible for trying to live as healthy a lifestyle as they possibly can, recognizing that we all have other environmental influences in our life as well. And, and to that point, drawing your, your mind to living in poverty and why it's so important for young people that we, we think about how we can free a, a children from poverty and take care of our most vulnerable is that if we're looking just from a, you know, a, a 30,000 foot view, someone's living in a, in a situation of poverty, their mom is under a lot of emotional distress, or they're in, in, this, in this situation, their mom or their dad are under a great deal of emotional distress. This can impact their home environment. And that leads to a child at school who may not be living up to uh, their, their capabilities, or they're having difficulty with getting along with other children. What you may see at a more microscopic level is that living under chronic stress can alter gene expression. It can cause epigenetic changes in the mom and in her offspring, altering hormone and neurotransmitter levels, which leads to emotional and behavioral consequences. The child isn't doing well in school. Now, I mentioned that uh, a mom who is under a lot of stress may not lick as much. And there are a number of experiments I just want to share with you. One, looking at limiting nesting material, which is very stressful for a mom rat. And what they found was that when she was under stress, when she didn't have enough nesting material to properly care for her pups, her care became less predictable and more fragmented. When she was under that level of stress, the pups were emotionally deprived. They weren't licked as much. And they experienced something called anhedonia, which is actually a depression symptom. It means a loss of pleasure in things that you would normally enjoy. So the pups weren't going into the normal rat jungle gym and playing with each other as much. They were kind of stressed out and depressed. What happened was there were cognitive consequences when they looked at those rats who had that emotional deprivation early in life, they actually in middle age 
had cognitive impairment, brain, negative brain changes in their middle age that, was, that made their brains look like they were very old rats. Even though when they were adolescents, they looked like they performed just fine, in, in their middle age, they looked like they had significant cognitive impairment already. Interestingly, in adolescence, when they put those adolescent pups under stress, they already had negative co cognitive changes. So their brains under stress look like a middle age or much older rat. This is the importance of making sure that you have a non-chaotic, uh, stable environment for raising children, or if you're not a parent yourself, that, and you have influence in the lives of the young people of some young people around you that you you try to limit chaos and have a more uh, stable environment is critically important for human babies as well because as this is Dr. Barham's quote that unpredictable fragmented parenting can lead to enduring impairment. Now that's not to say that all stress is bad stress. We know that stress can enable uh, rapid, often enduring adaptation to changing circumstance. So good stress can actually be very healthy. The kind of stress that's healthy is when it's short duration on the milder end, it can actually improve cognition, make your memory sharper, make you de make decisions. Your brain actually is in it's called neuroplasticity, the constant wiring and rewiring that happens with your brain and sort of short duration, milder stress can actually enhance that neuroplasticity. It's adaptive. It protects us. Uh, I not going down that dark alley because that's probably not the safest place for me to be. I'm going to go in a more light, well lit area on my way home. It is the intense, unpredictable, and prolonged stress that actually stifles neuroplasticity, that wiring and re rewiring that helps us learn and impairs cognition. And I think you'll all agree that we've all been living over the last year in a circumstance of chronic and unpredictable stress. We know that's not good for our brain. It's why we're worried about what's going to happen with the mental health of Canadians on the other side of this situation because chronic and unpredictable stress is associated with anxiety, with depression, with cognitive impairment, and with inflammatory illness. Now, our stress responses change at different times in our life. We, as we grow, different things are stressful. So uh, as if you've had a young baby, you know that most infants really enjoy being swaddled. It's quite calming. Most adults do not enjoy the swaddling experience. So your stress response system does change as you grow. And that's important to, to think about that why, why children are vulnerable to different kinds of stress and express and experience things differently. But we know that the type and the magnitude, the severity of stress changes with age and the, the age when the stress occurs. And the last bit on this is, is the fact that we know that a lack of, of care for young children can have catastrophic consequences uh, when we think about the impact on cognition, also emotional development and physical health. When we think of kids that are raised in orphanages and, and we're not touched, um, as well as studies in war and in famine. So this is, this is critically important information to understand and share. I do want to make the point because I tend to focus mostly on, of course, as a psychiatrist on the mental health impacts of early life adversity, but this slide kind of pulls it all together. And this is about uh, adversity having an impact, not just on our mental health, but also on our phys physical health. I'm going to walk you through this because it's a busy slide. It's a 32 year prospective study. And that means it's followed people for 32 years. That's a long study. And I'm gonna show you four different panels, but you can see the different colors. Blue, the blue color are individuals in this study that had no major adverse experiences. And by adverse experiences, they mean the loss of a loved one, a very se severe illness, having some abuse, uh, neglect, chaos in your childhood. Uh, the yellow color is one adverse event that was identified and the red two or more. And not surprising from what I've just told you that your risk if you've had multiple adverse events is increased for major depression as well as all mental illnesses. But what's interesting is CRP is a is a inflammatory marker C reactive protein, and you can see that if you've had more adverse childhood uh, experiences that your risk of 
high inflammation level is increased very significantly. And that also predicts the risk of you having metabolic risk factors. And so that means you have a higher risk for obesity, for diabetes, for heart disease. And that's why you see this increased risk of all diseases. So yes, early life adversity has an impact on your mental health, but it also creates an inflammatory milieu or an inflammatory risk that leads to a clustering of metabolic disorders, inflammatory illnesses, and all disease risk. So what can you do? Because I am a glass half full kind of person and I'm always looking for the upside of this. And I wanna point out to people who are on the line today that your personal history is absolutely important, but it does not define you. And if you have had a difficult childhood, it does not mean that you are, it's not a fait accompli that you're going to have mental illness or you're going to have physical illness, but it, it certainly helped me as a psychiatrist to understand and, and build my empathy for people that do struggle because often I have seen that they've come from some very challenging circumstances. The other part of that, and as you parent or you support a young person in your life, you are not your mother or your father, you are you, and your children are not you either. And so recognizing that we are different and that we have the opportunity to change and grow, which I'm going to talk about a lot more in the second half of this. What is the best way to protect children, even with a family history of abuse or neglect or chaos or mental illness, first and foremost, is to love them to try to create as a non-chaotic environment as possible, to promote good stress. It's important this helicopter parenting, I think has harmed our children that sometimes they need to see us fail and they need to fail themselves, dust themselves off and move ahead. And it's hard as parents because I think we know too much that we try to overprotect our kids and trying to avoid bad stress, uh, an acrimonious divorce, uh, humiliating your children. These things we know, especially if they're prolonged and severe are damaging. And the last part of this and where I'm going next is to foster resilience. So what is resilience? Resilience is, it's not just surviving adversity. It is actually the ability to emerge on the other side of adversity even stronger. Now, all of us pop out of the womb as individuals and we have different levels of vulnerability and resiliency. So some of us are, are really very resilient just by our nature, maybe by our temperament or as we develop our personality and others are, are more vulnerable. However, the good news is that you can learn to be resilient, absolutely. And also the more that you behave in a resilient manner, even if it's not comfortable or that you're fully engaged with, the more you behave in a resilient manner, manner, the more resilient you will become. Your brain is actually wired as you learn new things. The more you do things, the more the easier it is to do those things. So resilience is rooted in a number of different areas, and I'm going to talk about each one. One part is your natural drive to succeed. It's called self-actualization. Our ability to anticipate and accept change helps resiliency, our acceptance of what we can control, and also how we talk to ourselves. So I'm just going to quickly walk through each one to try to highlight how you build resilience. So self-actualization is hardwired. We are born on an innate drive to be our best selves and to live to our full potential. But I think most of us know that while that drive is there, sometimes life gets in the way. And most of us have been living with that over the last year. The good news is you can learn to harness or reawaken that drive, despite the fact that you're in difficult circumstances. This little quote comes from my husband, who it's my favorite thing that he says, which is expectations kill happiness. And the reality is that stress gets in the way of us being our best selves of self-actualization and stress happens when our expectations are not aligned with our reality. If you want your kid to be a doctor and they hate science, you're going to feel stress or disappointment. That is a problem, right? That we, we put expectations on other people. And if our expectations are constantly misaligned with our reality, you can't be your best self. You're going to feel stress. Now, that's not to say that you shouldn't try to positively influence your children or your partner or your workmates. But I think, and I hope that all of you have a moment to reflect on when you put your expectations on other individuals, it, it frequently leads to disappointment. 
And if you have excessive expectations on yourself, you also can be disappointed. Now, the other uh, part of this that, that sort of supports our resilience is our simple minds. And what that means is that, again, our brain is hardwired to make things simple. This is a, just a whole bunch of dots, but most of our brains have made that into a Dalmatian. If we didn't have the ability to simplify things, we would be overwhelmed all the time. Everything would seem too random and, and too difficult. So that's a good thing for our brain to do. But there's a downside to oversimplifying everything. It's called present bias. And what that means is that if we only focus on things that are comfortable and familiar and we simplify everything, we're going to miss the change until it slaps us across the face and says, hey, change is here. That's a problem for us. And it's actually a problem in, in science as well. When I think about in medicine, I remember when I was in, in, in medical school and somebody said to me, when you hear hoofbeats, you got to look for a horse, not a zebra. But sometimes there are zebras out there, right? A sore throat is usually just a virus and it's going to go away in a few days, but sometimes it's a strep throat. So you have to have your, you're always, you're on the lookout for a horse, but in the back of your mind, you're wondering, could there be a zebra out there too? And what are the things I need to do as a physician to make sure that I keep my patients safe and that I have in the back of my mind, there could be a zebra out there. Why is this important for, for resilience is the fact that we need to expect change. You know, there's a lot about make America great again, or we're all having this great desire to get back to normal, but normal is really an illusion. Life is all about change. And you have to think about life as it's now, and now it's now, and now it's now, <laughs> but it's always changing. It's always moving forward. And it's more comfortable to sit in the now than it is to have that expectation of change. But expecting change, the fact that it's constant, that it's inevitable, really is helpful in us being more resilient. What's going to happen once this pandemic is over? What's going to happen with our mental health or our finances or, or you know, where people live and, and the way we work? Nobody knows the answer to that. Nobody has a crystal ball. If we, somebody had a crystal ball, we would have been prepared for this pandemic and we weren't. There is a place for logic. We know from our past experience what to expect so we can make decisions based on that. Ultimately, we'd like to retire, so we're putting money away. We need to always think about the fact that change is coming. It's not as comfortable, but we're never going back to yesterday because tomorrow will be different. The other thing that I find very helpful in building resilience is a gift that I have given myself, which is the acknowledgement and true belief that the only human being on earth that I can control is me. That is the truth. I can't control my kids. As soon as they popped out, they screamed and pooed and did whatever they wanted. And that has continued to this day. My, uh, I can't control my partner. I can't control my workmates. I can control me, but I have enormous control over myself. I can con control my thoughts, my feelings, and my behaviors. And that was actually a huge relief. I don't have to bother trying to change anyone else because I can only control me. Now, being unable to control ourselves makes us feel very vulnerable and it provokes anxiety. So if you don't feel you have control over your emotions, that can make you even more emotional and feel more anxious. So this is something that it took me a long time to actually live. I knew it was important to accept the only person I can control is me. But once I actually started accepting it and living my life that way, it was truly a gift that I gave myself. Now, most human beings, most adults realize that they are responsible for our successes and our failures. I can control me, but I can't control everything that happens to me. And sometimes bad things happen to good people. Sometimes random events do occur. Now, individuals who feel entirely responsible for everything that happens, that is not good for your health because that leads to feeling distress and anxiety when things don't go your way. And then there are people who feel they have no control and they, they feel and become perpetual victims. So it's important to recognize that I can control me, but I can't control my environment. And sometimes crappy things happen and there is a random nature to life. But building resilience is the acceptance, I can control me and I can change me. Finally, 
our internal narratives, how we talk to ourselves. And most of us think that we make all of those important life decisions based on statistics and facts, but that ain't true. What we do is use statistics and facts to reinforce what we already believe. And that means that it's hard for us to create change because what we do is use the world to reinforce the beliefs we already have. So we also talk a lot to ourselves and you might not be aware of how much you do that. Some people are more or less aware, but the way that you talk to yourself is really critical in how you feel, you think, and you behave. If your internal story is really harsh and judgmental and negative, you're stupid, you do all the wrong things, then those negative thoughts and feelings and behaviors are going to follow. So to create positive life changes, you actually have to be more empathic with yourself. You have to change the way that you talk to yourself. To give you a little example of that, if I am, my conscious self is this little person riding this elephant, that conscious self, that's the verbal self, the thinking brain, the thinking ahead and organizing, but my unconscious and my emotional self is this elephant. If the elephant is upset, if it's emotional, I don't have a whole lot of control over it, right? I, I'm not able to tell the elephant where to go if he's upset and emotional. Your unconscious self, your emotional self has a lot of power, but you can start talking to yourself, calming that inner elephant and taking more control of your unconscious. You don't wanna be, you don't wanna be run by your reptile brain. You wanna have some control over your own thoughts and thinking and that, that kind of negative thought thought process that you have, I can't do it, the yeah buts, uh, it'll never work out, it actually scares the heck out of your, your elephant, your subconscious, and it drives worry and it drives anxiety. Whoops, it's also infectious. So it's not just coronavirus we're dealing with or COVID-19. Anxiety is also infectious. It infects uh, the children around us, our partners, our workmates. So it's important that you address it if you're struggling with anxiety. And it's also important to recognize that I, there's a difference between being having a negative conversation with yourself constantly and questioning your own ideas and options and, and, and having an internal dialogue that is constructive versus just the constant negativity. So just a recap on building resilience, it's really important to consider the expectations you place on yourself and on others, because that is a barrier to your building resilience, that you need to expect change because it is inevitable and to be prepared for that, that you have to accept that you are the only human being on earth you can control, but that you have a lot of control over yourself. That's the essence of cognitive behavioral therapy is learning to control your thoughts and feelings and behaviors, even though they may feel out of control. And you need to talk to yourself more empathically. Now, all of that is very important, but the best stress reliever is actually taking an action that creates change. So how do you do something that helps to relieve stress? And just very rapidly taking some target steps to create lasting change, First of all, changing that narrative. How you speak to yourself is critical. If you start off trying to create change by saying nasty things to yourself, it makes it so much harder to change. Break down the problem into smaller pieces. What are all the challenges I'm having? Write them down on a list. These are the greatest challenges. Then I want you to take, break that list down into what of these I can control. You can't control the fact that we're in a pandemic. You can't control the worldwide financial crisis or some kind of political aspect of our world, but you can control whether your house is a mess and you can control um, whether you're uh, being held hostage by your email, for instance. So pick the things you can control and then pick which one do I want to take a deep dive on. So for me, it's my email. I want to quit email. I've got way too many emails. So how do I fix that problem? And then you create step-by-step -step approach to that. Take small attainable steps, ask people around you, read a little bit about it. How do you control that thing that's driving you most bananas right now? Little by little. If you say, okay, now I'm going to quit email, that's not going to work. Small attainable steps are the best way to create change. And the last two points that help to support those change, nurturing yourself, but also nurturing your support network. You will need that support network and it is the greatest protector of your mental health. So making sure 
that when you are doing well, that you're keeping those connections strong, just reaching out and touching someone. Uh, it will be virtually now and letting them know that you're thinking about them, both at work and at home. We spend half our lives at work, so it's important to nurture those networks both at work and at home and learn every chance you get. I really appreciate you being here today and hopefully you've learned a little bit about epigenetics and genetics in general and about resilience. But anytime you have an educational opportunity at work, learning with your, your kids or with uh, someone else you care about, it helps to grow your brain. And every time you um, expose yourself to a new learning opportunity, your brain gets a little he healthier. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Diane. And uh, while we get to Q&A, everyone, uh, please feel free to send me a message, Jennifer Harrison, directly in the chat, and I will ask your question anonymously to Dr. McIntosh. Um, we've, we've had a few come in during your talk, Diane. We'll start off with uh, the first one. Um, this one's back to when you were talking about the heritability of epigenetic uh, changes. Can you clarify the mechanism by which a grandpa with a two pack per day smoking habit could affect his children and grandchildren? Yeah, and I, I don't want to get too deeply in it because it's rather complicated. But if you are um, granddad is a two pack per day smoker, that that toxin that comes from cigarette smoke can actually change how a particular gene that may promote cancer is uh, it may change the genetics or how that gene is transcribed. So the toxin affects a particular gene that may promote cancer. And what can happen is when you that granddad uh, got together with grandma and made uh, uh, your mom or your dad, they could have passed that genetic change onto your mom and dad, and then your mom or dad could have passed it on to you. So even though dad didn't smoke and you didn't smoke, the change that happened to that to your grandparents' genome actually got passed down to you. So it's in there, that risk, and then by some environmental insult could be turned on. That gene change could be turned on in you. And it, sometimes it's a gene that promotes cancer, or sometimes it's a gene that protects from cancer that is altered. So it, it is a very complicated process, but the gene change due to the toxin in your granddad could be passed down to your, your mom or your dad and then passed down to you. And for reasons that we probably won't be very clear on, it gets turned on or turned off in you leading to the onset of cancer. Thanks, Diane. The next one, and, and this seems to be a bit of a, a running theme. People are asking about their kids and how they can help them build resilience. But specifically, um, in one situation, the question is, I'm currently going through a divorce and have a three-year-old. How can I make his environment as stable as possible so he won't have the lasting effects on him during this difficult time for everyone? I just want to express my gratitude for that question because it's just such a critical question is, you know, the fact is that adult relationships break down, but what, what happens that's so negative and why it's actually going through a divorce as a child is captured in an adverse life event for some kids is because of the fact that they get drawn into the, the adults conflict and they sometimes are used as pawns. The reality is that you're stuck with your partner for the rest of your child's life. As long as you're, you have a child together, you need to be able to work together. And including your kid in the chaos and the upset and the hurt can be very harmful to them. They need both parents, what, whatever sex they are, they need both parents to be part of their life. And so the best way to protect your kid if you're going through that is uh, you know, when they're three, they're not going to understand very much, except maybe dad is going to be living somewhere else, but reinforcing that you love their dad because they are your father and they made you and that you want them to have that relationship. Now, of course, if it isn't, isn't safe for them to be with a, a partner, there was abuse or, or something, then it is, there are more delicate ways in those more challenging situations, but bashing um, a child's partner our parent can be really devastating. It's usually the parent who does the uh, bashing that ends up being in the long run in a more negative light. So trying not to pull your kid into the adversity, into the, the discord, the upset, the anger is, is a, a truly protective for those kids. 
Thank you, Diane. And another question um, about the the cognitive consequences you you mentioned on on mothers being stressed. Uh, the question is, you know, um, does it occur even when stress is transient, e.g., you know, months or weeks? And I think they're asking the question in the scope of we're almost a year into a pandemic and what impacts that could have. Right, and so. Uh, you're, you're right to ask that question. It is chronic, unpredictable, severe stress that I, of course, worry about the most. And through this pandemic, everyone's experiencing it differently. There's a lot of people that have lost their jobs. They might not be able to, they're worried about their housing. Can they put food on the table? This is absolutely um, highly stressful, just like the mom who can, doesn't have nesting material, the mom rat, that you know, not, you're, you're already dealing with a pregnancy, you're bringing a new life, into the world and you're not sure if you're going to have a job or childcare or be able to feed yourself, that is an important stress and makes us vulnerable uh, and, and therefore can make our child vulnerable. Now, the last thing I wanna do is freak everyone out. This is an important time if you're under that kind of level of stress to try to reach out to all of the resources you can through your family doctor. Um, maybe you need a, a therapist and there are lots that work on a sliding scale, uh, group support, but the, the greatest protector in these kind of circumstances are social support. And being alone in that, being isolated in that, very stressful. So everything you can do to try to lower that stress level is very important. It is chronic, unpredictable, chronic or, or a severe stress that makes uh, mom most vulnerable and therefore her, her um, fetus more vulnerable. Uh, having an acute or short-term stress, most people will be able to ride that wave and get through it. It depends on really how vulnerable or resilient they are. Uh, so it's really the long-term unpredictable stress I'm most concerned about. Thank you, Diane. Another question we've had come in uh, a couple times is, uh, can you share any resources or, or strategies to help reframe negative self-talk? That's really the essence of cognitive behavioral therapy. And for some people, very expensive, hard to access, don't have it through work, but uh, you can actually use books. There's websites, there's all, and many that are free that can help you to learn how to um, identify your negative thoughts, which is the first thing. Cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT, cognitive means your thoughts, your feelings, Behavioral means your behavior and the therapy. So it is. it has the most scientific evidence for helping to change your thinking and your feeling. And there's lots of different ways that you can do this through books or uh, online or face-to-face. -face. And one of the first pieces to that is to actually take the time to think about and identify the negative thoughts. I'm a loser, I'm stupid, I do everything wrong. That some people have those thoughts all the time that they're so used to having them that they don't even recognize that they're talking to themselves in such a negative way. So the first step in cognitive therapy is starting to identify those thoughts and feelings that people have, and then to confront them. What is the evidence that I'm the biggest loser in the world? What is the evidence that I'm X or Y or Z, the way that you talk to yourself? And so following a process, whether online or in a book, step-by-step -step can really help to create that change. I, I want to make, again, the point that you can only control you, but we do have a huge amount of control over ourselves, our thoughts and our feelings and behaviors. But the first step is actually identifying there's an issue here. I need some help. And how am I going to access that help? Every time you learn something new, you, you confront a thought and you work on that. It seems very artificial at the beginning and very clunky. No, that's not true. I'm not a bad person. It can feel very artificial, but the more you do it, the more your brain wires, so that is automatic. You don't have to think, no, I'm not a bad person. You actually stop having that negative thought all the time. So your brain, as you learn, actually rewires and makes it easier every step of the way. Thank you, Diane. Um, next question. What are some of the signs of distress we should look for and how can we help a colleague or a friend or a family member we suspect is struggling with their mental health? Yeah, that, uh, 
it, that's a, it's a big question. Everyone's a little bit different, but if I'm thinking about a colleague, it would be, you, you know, you know, someone quite well, they're usually very prepared for um, presentations at work. They show up on time and suddenly they're not showing up on time. They're seeming more negative. They don't look like they're caring for themselves as well. Uh, there's a real change in behavior. I, every mental illness is associated not just with symptoms, but also with functional impairment. So they're not functioning at work, at home, in their social lives the way they normally would be. So if you notice changes in functioning, self-care, uh, they're, they're showing up on time, those kinds of things, that's when it, there's a it's time to have a, a thought, a conversation with them. Are you doing okay? And sometimes people don't want to tell you, but just asking if, if they're okay. And if they say, yeah, I'm fine. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, I'm here. If you need, if you need me, I'm here to help. I'm here as a voice. I, I can, I can help you any in, in many different ways. Please feel safe that anything you share with me is going to stay with me. Sometimes with your friends, uh, a friend will tell you I'm struggling with depression or I'm struggling with anxiety. First of all, offering, how can I help? But knowing that sometimes people will tell you, but they, they just want you to be their friend. So some of us have this uh, desire to help all the time. I want to help. What can I do? What can I make a difference? And maybe they're, the help for them is just to be your normal self and to be their friend, but to recognize that you know, they might not be quite themselves and might not be behaving as usual or, or reaching out as often, or maybe they'll have something specific that you could be helpful with. But I think just expressing your concern, letting them know you're there, and how can I help you? whether it's just to be myself or maybe to make that appointment or drive you or take care of your kids or whatever during uh, to get an appointment. So everyone's a little different. Look for the functional changes. They're not themselves. Thank you, Diane. Next question. Um, in the scope of the pandemic, uh, a lot of Canadians have reported higher levels of anxiety, depression, other mental health issues. Um, how can I monitor my own mental health and what's healthy in this situation or normal and what's concerning? I think it's such a, a great question and it's why I believe that the same way that we talk about sexual health now in school, even starting in kindergarten, we need to start to talk and give kids a vocabulary around mental health. What's normal? What's not normal? You know, it's, it's normal to be afraid of certain things. And it, it, what is normal from a stress perspective changes with time. So it, it's functionally normal for young kids to be afraid of the dark or to worry about the loss of a parent at some point, right? Because they have this sudden awareness. Wow, you know, people die and oh my gosh, could that happen to you? So what, what is normal is one of those things that I think we really struggle with, what is normal anxiety and what is too much anxiety? But if you find that you're not able to do things the way that you normally would, that um, you're functioning at work or at home, your patience as a, as a parent or as a partner has changed, you're irritable, your sleep has gone off or your appetite is, is changed. And by sleep going off and appetite change, when someone becomes depressed, they can want to sleep 24 seven and never feel rested, or they can not sleep at all and have insomnia. Same thing for appetite. Sometimes when people are depressed, they can't stop eating or they're binging in the evenings, often on carbohydrates, or they've lost their appetite entirely. So big changes in your normal biorhythms are, are an indicator that you're not doing as well as, as normal. And perhaps you need some help. I would urge everyone who's having, you know, any of this that makes sense, you're anxious, you're worried, things aren't happening, or you're not functioning as normal, reach out to your family doctor. If you don't have a family doctor, use a, a virtual care platform, go to a walk-in clinic. And if you don't get the answers you need or the support you need from the first person you ask, please don't give up. There is always a path ahead. As for things you can do for yourself, exercise, and it's a good news story, when I say exercise, no Lululemon required, I'm not looking for a four minute mile, 30 minute walk a day is enough, enough to get your heart rate up 30 minute walk a day, a brisk walk, not a small, the flowers walk, a brisk walk is enough to grow new brain cells and to help to protect you from depression and anxiety. So exercise every day, a healthy gut biome 
and that it's interesting that diet has come up repeatedly, but a Mediterranean diet, trying to limit the amount of bread, cereal, rice, pasta, sugar, doesn't mean you eliminate it, but that you try to keep that on the low end and have um, healthy fats in your diet. It protects your gut biome, keeps those bacterium healthy, keeps your weight more healthy, and also protects against depression and anxiety. Thanks, Diane. I think we have time for one more question before we have to wrap. Um, you mentioned uh, sleep being a, an issue right now for some people. Uh, the question is, I've been having a hard time falling asleep lately. What are your tips to help get a good night's sleep? So I have a whole whack of tips. For, there's good sleep hygiene. I wrote a book last year called this, or I guess it's 2019 called this is depression. And in there, at, there's a whole sleep section about, you know, what are some important sleep hygiene tips to follow? And um, some of the most critical things are making sure that you're sleeping in a cool, dark, quiet room, if you possibly can. Don't have your pets on your bed. First of all, it's important dogs aren't on your bed because your dogs will not be good dogs if they are. But trying to keep your bed uh, as a sacred sleeping place. Sleep and sex is the only thing that's allowed there so that you don't work from your bed. Um, not having screen time right before you go to bed. So that's TV, your cell phone, your computer. Give yourself an hour before bedtime. Do something quiet and boring, boring leading up to your sleep time. Time. using mindfulness apps can be very helpful for getting off to sleep and my best tip for the middle of the night you wake up and this happens to a lot of us sometimes and your brain starts going down that rabbit hole of I'm worried about this and that and the worry is bigger than ever because you're half your brain is still asleep so you're running on just your reptile brain that's saying oh my gosh the world is coming to an end I'm worried about this and that and you don't have the front part of your brain saying simmer down relax so what can you do in that time? Try to distract yourself. And the way I do it is to try to think about the US states in alphabetical order. I know that sounds ridiculous, but if you are focused on Alaska, Alabama, I think Alabama's first, Alaska. So you thinking about in, in something that's very boring, very <laughs> uh, useless, but keeping your brain on that there's actual scientific research showing that that can help you get back to sleep. If you don't know a long list of something like that, you'd never do it. You couldn't stick to it. Think about a documentary you watched recently and try to uh, say it to yourself from the opening credits and walk yourself through it. It has to be boring, monotonous, and that can help you to get off to sleep. Thanks so much, Diane. I think that, that wraps up today's session. Well, thank you for having me, everyone. Be safe.